everyone and welcome to the webinar. Uh, today's topic is integrating Phoenix Project Manager with the Acumen Software Suite. Uh, this is Tom Poland from Acumen and along with me today from Phoenix is Jay Paulson and we'll be co-presenting today. Jay will be talking about aspects of Phoenix Project Manager and I'll be talking about aspects of the Acumen Suite. Um, before we begin, um, what each of us are going to do is talk a little bit about our respective companies and then I'll also be talking a little bit more about our S1 to S5 um, ma scheduling maturity model uh, which is an internationally recognized model and everything we'll be talking about today from Phoenix Project Manager through uh, S5 having a, a, a team aligned plan everything we're talking about is going to fall into these S1 to F S5 categories more on that in a few minutes First, let me talk a little bit about Acumen before Jay talks a little bit about Phoenix. Um, Acumen, uh, we say it right up front, and the key word to me here is really analytics, proven project analytics. Um, we've been uh, developing project management software that has a strong focus on analyzing the plan, assessing the quality of the forecast, using risk management uh, principles to um, really run the forecast to the ringer, modify the forecast if needed, optimize and accelerate the plan, and then go to a team aligned plan. We believe that a sound plan is the absolute foundation to begin this exercise. And we also believe, as we'll be showing you with Acumen Risk, that you cannot do forecasting without consideration of risk the known risks and the unknown risks, and a reasonable assessment of how they can impact your project plan. More on all of this, I just wanted to talk about our core level philosophy. Uh, we have a few items here. We've, uh, in 2012, um, we uh, received a couple of recognition items. Um, since the time that I've been in Acumen, and actually before I was with Acumen um, as a customer, um, I've seen them come a long way and move very quickly uh, as a company and, and these uh, recognition items are certainly representative of that. Um, overall in the leadership of the company there's over 20 years of project management software development experience. Um, our legacy spans these products here, Open Plan, Pertmaster, Fuse, and the Schedule Index that I'll be showing you more about. Um, we've also been leaders in risk workshop delivery and that uh, that foundation, that uh, experience in hands-on real-life risk workshops has directly contributed uh, to what you'll see in our risk tool today. Um, so more on all of this in a few minutes and especially this S1 to S5, but before I go there I want to turn it over to Jay um, to talk a little bit about Phoenix CPM and, and your background there, Jay. All right, thanks Tom. So. Uh, Phoenix Project Manager is a scheduling software. You know, our focus is on scheduling. Um, you know, our really intention on creating Phoenix was to create a product that it's easy to create a schedule in and easy to manage that schedule. Um, you know, and, and, and so much in our experience, you know, the, the schedule ends up uh, not being understood by the entire team. It's not really looked at by the entire team. And so we wanted to be able to uh, create a tool that gave you better communication of your schedule and let you create better looking schedules that you could communicate uh, what your plan is to people. Um, our background is one of our co-founders helped develop the first PERT system on the Polaris missile project and we've been in scheduling ever since. Uh, we created uh, Phoenix as a scheduling consulting company to use in-house and to do schedules the way that we did them and uh, create a tool that was easier to use and uh, gave us better results. And we created it, used it in-house for a while, made it better and better, and then decided to start selling it into the wild. And so that's uh, basically our background. Cool. Well, thank, thanks, Jay. Um, I've actually been using the Phoenix tool uh, for a little while now. Now that we've um, uh, incorporated the integration of Phoenix in, into Fuse, and of course you'll be demonstrating it, but you know I'll, I'll say it was very easy for me as someone with scheduling experience uh, to get into and, and use. And, and you're 100% right about the the rich visual inter interface. Uh, 
everyone's going to see that. There's no reason for me to talk much about it. Um, but you know, I thought it was. I think it's a very compelling product, and I, I plan to continue to use it. Um, let's talk about this schedule maturity framework um, that I put up on the screen because, like I mentioned, this is going to be the foundation of everything we'll be talking about as we demonstrate um, the the tools. The, the purpose of today is is yes to show you. Um, how the tools work, how they look, how how easy they are to use, but the over overriding theme here is how, as we use the tools, we're moving the schedule along this maturity model. In fact, one of the schedules that Jay will be showing you today is one of the schedules that I'll be showing um, you and Fuse today. So you'll be able to see this schedule as we take it through this S1 to S5 maturity cycle. Um, so let's talk about it in detail for just a couple of minutes because uh, I, I know everyone on the line is excited to see the, the products as well, so I want to leave ample time for that. But first, S1. This is your schedule basis. This is A, getting to that schedule baseline and where you have a linked CPM schedule that shows you the start through the work to the, to the everyone's looking at that finish date and, and you certainly have that as well. And then, of course, as part of the S1 process, you have your monthly updates as well. Um, since things can be changed monthly, both in the status department, but then also in logic, items move on and off the critical path, um, that schedule, S1, needs to be evaluated every month as well. So Phoenix, on its own, is a fantastic interface to enter in that schedule baseline, uh, review it, and then provide monthly updates. Uh, but then also in, in Fuse 360 and Risk, I'll show you how we can take that schedule and then take these items, the diagnostics, the scenario generation, and the risk to the next level. And that's exactly where S2 through S5 takes us. In the S2 phase, what I'll do is I'll take one of Jay's schedules, I'll pull it in, into Fuse, and I hope I don't hurt Jay's feelings when I do this, but I'll actually be bringing up some areas in the sample schedule where I think there's opportunities for improvement and more time may need to be spent in the S1 phase. Um, so, you know, in the real world, Jay and I would work iteratively and we'd solve, we'd solve those problems. Then we move on to S3 where we bring probabilistic and deterministic risk into the picture. We will assign uncertainty to different activities and we'll also take a very tangible risk register and map those risks to activities in the schedule to see what impact they may have through a Monte Carlo simulation. In S4, we're going to realize that our risk-adjusted scenario um, takes us past our contractual end date. That's not a good position to be in. So what we'll do is we'll use 360 to optimize the schedule and see if we can work our way back to that contract completion date. Finally, in S5, we use the reports, both available from Phoenix Project Manager and through these three tools so that the team all the way up through executive level can get a good look at what's in the schedule and what's in the plan and approve it, buy into it, and that becomes the working model moving forward. So without, uh, without further explanation, now that we've gone through the maturity model, I'm going to hand control over to Jay, who's running uh, Phoenix CPM, and I'm going to make him presenter. And Jay, you should be prompted to share your screen. Got it. All right. So, uh, like I said, Phoenix is really easy to use. That was our, our main goal. Is you know, uh, it's you should be able to spend more time planning and and that than uh, struggling with the software. So, but I'll kind of show you how to uh, go through and create a new project in Phoenix, and then I'll show you a couple of the great features that help you uh, communicate your plan to people. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead. And click new project and we'll do start a new one uh, and in here we have you can schedule with multiple calendars uh, you know in here we've got basic defaults there's like a five six day and seven day calendar um, you can go through and modify those add holidays and things like that I have a couple of files that I use for templates that I have uh, holidays already built into um, and I save those and when I start a new project, I'll just use that. Uh, go ahead and click new. Um, 
And then as you go through here to add activities, all you really do is you can start typing and uh, and go ahead and it's really kind of like doing an Excel spreadsheet. You can just add activities pretty quickly in here. Let me add some blank ones and put in some durations. And then relating activities is actually really easy too. Actually, from a lot of uh, um, SureTrack and P3 users, they, they don't think that you can tie things graphically in here, but we have uh, context-sensitive pointers. And so if you mouse over the end of an activity, you can see that it uh, gets this left-right cursor, and that allows you to drag the activity and extend the duration. Or as soon as you move up and down, the activity will snap back, and then you're able to tie activities together. And you can actually see the cursor changes and it'll tell you what kind of activity relationship you're creating. So you can see here it's a Twinkie with a tail on it. And then as soon as I hover over the start of this one, it shows kind of a finish to start relationship. I can drop that. Another good way to tie activities, something that I like, is you can just drop in the blank somewhere and uh, relate multiple activities. You can create a bunch of finish to start relationships and then schedule it and it'll show you what happens and Phoenix is really uh, CPM based you know it's you can create to-do lists in here but it's harder to create a to-do list than it is to just do a proper schedule uh, by relating activities together and, and uh, doing it the proper way um, so you know you can go through and start building your schedule like I said there's a lot of defaults set up in here um, I'll go through the code library a little bit. Um, in here, when you start a new project, we have a few codes already set up. There's project, phase, responsibility, area, and location. And then there's just some blank values in here. And this is just to give you an idea of the structure. Um, you can go ahead and delete all of these if you want and start new ones. And we can do... Uh, oh. I like to do it just call them level one, level two, level three, level four. And so, you know, you can add activity codes in here. Let me open a new one. And once you get your schedule, uh, built, you know, like a lot of your activities in there. Sometimes people like to build the code library first. Uh, in this one, I've got a blank code library. I've got my level one, level two, level three, and level four. Um, so there's two ways you can do it. You can go, go in and build your code library in here. And uh, click add value, and we'll make this. Um, detail project schedule and you can add in the values in here or uh, you can do them on the fly um, let me show you how to add them to activities we have an activity code toolbar and the way you use this is to organize by level one you check that box you can see there's no value assigned to any of these activities in the schedule yet um, to assign activities to it, I'll just gonna select all of these because they all belong to the detail project schedule. And select that, and you can see that now it says detail project schedule. And then say I want to put these under uh, project milestones. I'll do uh, let's see, select these, and then type project milestones, and hit enter. You can see it didn't put a code bar up there. All you have to do to get that up is check that level two box and it'll organize by that. You can turn off the organization, turn it on and off up here. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. So once you get all these coded in that, uh, your schedule should look something similar to
this right here. And this is the schedule that Tom will be picking apart today. <laughs> I've had that happen a number of times working for a contractor in the past. But uh, with Fuse, it's a lot easier to see what's actually going on in a schedule. It's a great tool to um, really dig into a schedule. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of the stuff we did in here, uh, we made it easier. It was stuff that re we really wanted to see in scheduling software. Um, you know, one of the things you can really do very easily in here is add cost to a schedule. A lot of the times when we were uh, yeah, working for a contractor, they just wanted to add cost to an activity. They weren't really concerned about uh, cost accounts and, and doing a lot of the things that you can do with cost. They just wanted to really add it to an activity and see where they should be. Um, to add cost, the easiest way to do it is to just put in a budgeted cost column. You can do that by going to Format and Columns. And uh, in here, there's a huge list of columns you can add. You can add that to your active columns. I've already got it in here. And all you really have to do is type in a number to an activity. Uh, you don't have to add cost accounts. You can do that later. Uh, but really pretty easy to just tie a number to an activity. Um, and then another thing that I like is uh, you can see there's these non-driving relationships in here represented by the dotted lines. Those can be easily turned on and off. Um, you can show non-driving relationships or turn that off. Uh, that's really nice for when you print out your schedule and you know your uh, limited to a small portion of a piece of paper to show everything and a lot of the times when you're uh, printing out a schedule you you know it's sometimes better to just show the driving relationships and then your schedule when it's printed doesn't look as messy um, two of the really neat things about Phoenix uh, one of them is we have what's called status on master and status on current um, right here you can see this is an updated schedule the blue being progress and uh, the red and green being remaining duration on activities. Um, you can see the data date here, and there's some actually there's some remaining duration that's behind the data date, and there's also progress that's beyond the data date. It's on the right side of the data date. This view is called status on master in Phoenix, and what this allows you to do is just run your finger down the data date and see what's ahead and behind schedule. Um, you know, that's really the purpose of doing an update is to find out where you're ahead and behind. But the other purpose of an update is to also show what this does to your project. You know, so on here it shows miscellaneous steel and air handler support framing ending on 917. Well, it's behind schedule, and so that's really not where it's going to end. You can see it's behind schedule here, but if we go to scheduling options, change this to status on current click OK, and then reschedule it. This will show that it now moves out to 926. And so that's really where it's going to complete now. But in this view, you can see where your project is going to be, but you can't really see what uh, what is ahead and behind. So that's, these two views really complement each other, and they're uh, a great way to um, display your status on a project. I really like using the uh, status on master view um, for job trailer wall schedules and uh, it's, it's one of my favorite ways to communicate project status. One of the other great features of Phoenix and one of the real reasons we built Phoenix was for our network diagram. Uh, um, this is a method of uh, scheduling a little bit old school tell people used to draw schedules um, but in here you know what you're able to really do is let me turn off these nodes um, you're able to put more than one activity online and this really lends itself to plotting out large schedules and hanging them on a job, tra job trailer wall. Uh, what we typically do is we're able to, I, I'll build the schedule in bar chart and then I come in here into network diagram and I org organize it in a way that makes sense and uh, it's really a, a great way to do things. I, I can fit, you know, two or three thousand activities on one large plotted out piece of paper and you're able to follow the critical path all the way through the schedule um, you know and using it with status on math 
monster. You know, somebody can walk up, see exactly what your plan is to build the project, follow the critical path through the schedule, and you know, really see what's going on in your schedule. Um, we've done little tests where we have our network diagram plotted out and hung up on a wall, and then we'll have you know our stack of 11 by 17, 50 pages or whatever sitting in front of it. And some people will pick up the, the schedule, the 11 by 17, and thumb through it for a second, but they all end up looking at the uh, network diagram. It's really a great tool. And with the status on master, uh, being able to see you know exactly who is behind schedule, um, it's really invaluable on a project to communicate your plan. But uh, I think that's all I've got on Phoenix for now, Tom. So I'll pass the uh, presentation back to you, and then you can go and show how I uh, where my schedule needs improvement. Are you sure you want me to do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. Um, you know, a couple things um, as, as you're going through uh, Phoenix there. Um, the one thing I noticed is, uh, let's see, I, I've been working with different scheduling tools. In fact, you've mentioned a couple of the ones that I've used in days past. Um, I've been working with tools since about 1995. And in fact, in the logic diagram, you kind of mentioned the old school approach. And one thing that I latched to immediately using Phoenix is it reminded me of a lot of the more basic features that I used to take for granted that can be harder to find as the tools have become more complex. Uh, Phoenix has really stayed grounded in a lot of the basic principles of CPM, uh, getting the information into the system, and as you said, doing it right, creating a, a, a logic network. Um, you said it's actually easier to do in Phoenix than, uh, than creating just a, a task list or a checklist, and I found that to be the case uh, as well. Uh, but at the same time, what I saw was Phoenix was taking those basic features to the next level as well without overcomplicating them. Um, so it's been uh, it's been a good experience using it. And I appreciate uh, appreciate the demonstration uh, today. Um, one thing I want to uh, point out is, in fact, I see a couple people asking questions um, already. Is in your go to go to webinar control panel. There is a questions area where you can type in um, where you can type in questions, and what we'll do at the end is uh, uh, Jen from Acumen will, will pipe in and she'll ask some of the questions. If we don't get to all the questions today, we're still going to answer all of them uh, for you. Uh, if you leave your uh, um, let's see, we've got we've got your names as well, and we've got your contact information, so we'll get back to you on all the questions as well, even if we don't have time um, to answer them today. So uh, let's see, I've got control back. I'm going to I'm going to go full screen, and and Jay, can you just double check me that you see me full screen in Acumen Fuse right now? Yeah, it looks like it. You look good. Okay, good, excellent, thank you. Um, and and as Jay mentioned, I've pulled in a couple of his schedules here. I pulled in uh, the one uh, that he was using uh, today, um, and I pulled in a few of my own as well into this little enterprise structure that I've created here uh, in in Acumen. Um, I'm going to go through the basics of the applications. Um, I'm going to go step step by step. I certainly can't get to all these functions that we have here, but I'm going to go through um, some of the ways that I've gotten the most out of using Fuse, RISC, uh, and 360. And I'm excited now that we have this Phoenix Project Manager button right here on the main screen. Basically, to load these files in today, what I did is I clicked the button up here, took me to my Phoenix folder, and I just double clicked the file name and I imported those uh, into the system here. Um, it was very easy to do. In fact, you'll see for some of these, I have indented items. And what that means is those are snapshots. Those are monthly pictures of the schedule information. So for instance, here, initial plan is my baseline and I pulled in a one month update and a six month update. And then for, um, for one of Jay's projects here, um, I had uh, an April and then a September update as well. So, We'll be, we'll be looking at some of these different schedules, see if we see any common themes um, as we go through. Um, this screen here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. This is just the, um, uh, the basics of the schedule um, that, I'm, that I'm selected on. It's showing, me, uh, it's showing me a basic Gantt chart out here. It's showing me the activities. I use this uh, screen just to make sure that, A, that I've imported the right schedule, and then, B, to uh, make sure that at the top level, these uh, start and finish dates are in line with my expectations. 
if my finish date doesn't pass the, my common sense test, I'm going to go back over to Phoenix and I'm going to make sure that I've done everything and linked everything properly. Um, but assuming that takes place, the first place that I go is the diagnostic screen. And Jay, I'm looking right at that uh, schedule that we were just looking at um, in Phoenix. Um, oh, no. In fact, actually, uh, while, while you were uh, in my second screen, while you were um, showing us the schedule, I was doing a quick, uh, quick analysis on it. So let me go back to the main view here, and I'll show you some of the things that I found. Uh, the one thing that I noticed right away is that this project has some missing logic. In fact, there's 33 items in total that are missing either a predecessor or a successor. And then I've broken the information out by year as well. So I can see that some of these items were in the past, and I'm not going to worry so much about those. They're done. Um, but there are some current items, and there's some future items as well. Um, in fact, I've got the number here, 21, and then it's telling me that represents 7% um, of the scheduled activities during that time. These five represent 56% of the activities in the 2014 time frame. And then finally, at the total level, the 33 missing logic activities represent 10% um, of the total schedule. I'm going to go ahead and click on, oh, I clicked in the wrong place. Hang on. I'm going to go ahead and click on missing logic. And it's going to list for me the 33 items in the schedule that have missing logic. And if I need to know more about that activity, I can scroll here. Hopefully that's coming across okay on the on the webinar, and I can see all the different characteristics and attributes of the activities, and I can sort say by finish date to see the near term versus the longer term items. Uh, so I can use this to focus my energy on on the near term items, and then maybe if I don't if I'm constrained either on time or resources right now, um, I can I can worry about the future items later. Now, now that's not necessarily the best policy, especially when it comes to missing logic. I want that to be completely seamless so that I have a true forward and backward uh, critical path method uh, pass on, on, each, on each activity and the schedule as a whole. Um, let's look at some of the items, other items here. I'm pleased to see that there's no hard constraints in this, in this schedule at all. The, um, you're, you're letting the CPN CPM engine do its job here by not artificially constraining dates, um, and there's no negative float in the schedule as well. Now, once the missing logic gets linked, negative float could become an issue, but right now at this point, um, there's, no, um, uh, there's no negative float. Let's see, insufficient detail. Let's see what I'm going to drag over here, and there's an explanation. Uh, these are activities that have a duration longer than 10% of the total duration of the project. Um, so there are some items where Fuse considers them to maybe have a higher duration than, uh, than we'd normally expect. Um, it's just a guide. You might have reason. Let's go ahead and click here. We can look at some of these 14 activities. Um, there certainly could be a reason um, for these. We'll sort them by uh, duration so we get a good idea of, of how high we've gone in terms of duration. There is an activity here that has 119 days of duration. Um, so Fuse is just giving us a warning that maybe there's more detail needed on some of these tasks that are, you know, three to five months long. Um, the good news here is we can basically line them up and look at them one by one. Um, there's even a feature where we can annotate and we can put in some notes with an explanation as to why we've maybe used a longer duration on this activity uh, than we typically uh, expect. We also have the ability to exclude any items from the check um, as well. Um, let's lags and leads. You know, it seems pretty uh, seems pretty reasonable. Uh, let's go ahead since we do have some missing logic. Um, I have another tab down here called logic. So let's take a look uh, at logic in more detail and see what's going on here. Um, let's see. There's some missing predecessors. Those are in the past. Um, your future items actually all have predecessors, which is really good. Um, in the future, though, 2000. 13, 2014, um, there's some missing successors. Uh, so we'll definitely want to sit down with our project scheduler and the engineer and see if we can tie off some of these loose ends. And again, I can click here to see exactly which 21 items are missing successors. I can scroll down and see the whole list here. Um, 
let's see, I, I have the breakdown here of the different logic types that, that you're using. I'm actually, I'm pleased to say there's no start to finish predecessors. Most, uh, uh, most shops don't like using those and you don't have any. Um, logic density, that's the average number of relationships on every task. Uh, it, it's, it's a little higher than green, but certainly not, you know, not too far out of line, about three. Um, I start getting nervous when I see about six to 10 links per activity. Merge hotspots. This is where uh, activities have a high number of predecessors coming into them. And then diverge hotspots are where activities have a high number of successors. Those are ones to look out for because they certainly can add some, some risk. They can be a single point of failure, um, especially on a diverge hotspot. Uh, open starts, open finishes. I'm going to talk more about these in a couple minutes when we get to um, our logic tab. Uh, let's look at your float picture here. Um, it seems the majority or close to the majority of your activities, let's look at the totals up here in the ribbon analyzer. Um, you have some activities that have zero days of float, about 15%. Um, then you have uh, the, the largest group here has uh, zero to 20 days of float and then 20 to 30 days of float. So I'm pretty comfortable about your float picture. I think once some of the missing logic gets tied out, the, some of these high float items are going to go away. I, I think we have a case here where um, the missing logic is, is driving some of our flow behavior. My only concern would be is as we start tying out the missing logic that uh, we might end up with more zero float or maybe even some negative float activities as well because th those might expand um, your critical path. That's critical path is running at 35 items uh, right now. Um, I didn't say much about this screen. What, what I tried to do, um, and this is where I spend most of my time in Fuse, what I tried to do is, is use it. And actually, I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with, with Jay's schedules uh, before the webinar. I kind of wanted to, uh, to dig my hands into it while I was talking to you all and, and see where I thought some of the, um, some of the issues are. Um, what this diagnostic screen does for me is it give, gives me a very quick way to do an assessment on either one of my own schedules or maybe a subcontractor schedule that gets sent to me that I need to do an evaluation on. One of the tools we have to do this evaluation is this score that you see over here on the right hand side. I have a, a schedule index score both for the ribbon analyzer, which is the project as a whole, and then also for each individual phase. And obviously, I'm most concerned, here's my, here's my data line, I'm most concerned with my score from the present day going forward. Now, if I'm concerned about that score, and I am a little bit concerned about my 53% score, I'd like to see my schedule score maybe closer to 75%. Uh, what I'm able to do, and I noticed in this schedule, there's some fields like uh, there's level one, level two, level three, and I started experimenting a little bit here to see what was in there. And I'm going to sort by score down with the level three items. And I have these different categories as I, um, as I scroll down here. I have engineering milestones, owner agency support services, engineering package. And as you can see, as I scroll down, since I've sorted by score, I'm getting towards some of the lower score items as I go. In fact, I'm starting to see some red on these shop drawings, approval, and fabrication tasks. I'm seeing uh, some relatively high logic density, insufficient detail, and some merge hotspots as well. And as I go further down here, my score is getting lower, and, and I'll probably start seeing some more red, yellow uh, as I go down. Uh, finally, down to uh, detailed engineering and subcontractor engineering, um, where I not only do I have kind of a high logic density, I also have a number of tasks that are very high in duration. Uh, my concern is if I see an area called detailed engineering and I feel I have insuff insufficient detail, I might have a different kind of hotspot. I might have a risk hotspot here as well. Uh, if I don't have a lot of detail, that could tell me that I might have a high amount of variation um, in the actual, actual executed durations of these tasks. And uh, these could slip my schedule. I'm also a little bit concerned about uh, um, critical, I, that I don't have any detailed engineering um, 
tasks on the critical path, that could be a good thing. But I'm a skeptic by nature, <laughs> and I'm a little bit concerned that there's no detailed engineering tasks on the critical path. So we, we might need to go into your cool um, uh, relationship view, logic diagram view in, in Phoenix, and, and really see where these detailed engineering tasks are falling in the logic. Just because I don't have missing logic on these activities doesn't mean that I don't have the right logic on, on these activities um, as well. So um, just kind of a basic, uh, uh, basic assessment. Of, of that project, um, I'm going to I'm going to change my view here. I'm going to go back over to one of my other projects here, um, where I have initial plan, and, and then I also have a one month update, a six month update. I'm going to do some analysis on this other schedule. I think we'll see some of the same problems, maybe some different problems, um, as well. Um, so here I am at schedule quality view, and let's see. Okay, oh, wrong thing here. You can see I've got some missing logic. That's probably the most common item <laughs> that I see when I pull a schedule into views is, is missing logic, and we, we put it right here first on the list. Um, and let me, let me do some trending. We've been looking at the red, yellow, green, and that's good. Um, I like the, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to, A second. Okay. I'm just going to create a little float view here. Real simple. I've got my um, initial plan, my one month update, my six month update, and I have them lined up here from left to right. These are three different versions of the same schedule. The initial plan was my baseline. The one month update was after one month of execution and six month update date, of course, was after six months of execution. And I decided to pick on negative float. Um, the term that I use here is float erosion. Um, and, and I normally do see float erosion on a number of projects uh, that, I, that I work on. So the question becomes how much and how bad, <laughs> and if we're able to reverse course. Uh, we can see here that we baseline the project uh, with seven negative float items. Uh, we quickly have gone, in one month, we went to 13 items that had negative float. And six months in, we've held the line, which is good. I don't see the trend increasing from the one month to six month, but I don't see it decreasing as well. Depending on the length of this project, this could really be an issue because I don't want to get closer and closer to execution while still having negative float in my plan. What I'm able to do is if I had a seventh month update file, eighth month, one year update, I could continue adding these to these chart, this chart. So every single month, I can do the same fuse analysis on my project and see if I'm getting improvements or if I'm getting, in the case of float, if I'm getting erosion. And I can start adding. I can make this too busy if I wanted to. Um, I tend to just click away here. I can add all my different metrics to this trend chart. So I can look at trends relative to one another. As missing logic is improving, am I getting more and more tasks on the critical path? Um, that's something to look out for. Also, this is a good time to point out, in fact, let me go back to my main, the view that I use the most, which is this color stoplight view. I sh showed you these metrics. I went briefly through some of these. I know I'm moving a little bit quickly. Um, I showed you some logic metrics where I could make sure that I didn't have start to finish dependencies. Um, I can pull up a constraints view um, where I show you all the different kinds of constraints that have been used on this project and, and when they've been used. I'm not limited to just what's on these tabs right here. There's two things that I can do, in fact. I can go through this library that we provide that has almost 300 metrics available right out of the box anywhere from baseline compliance to risk metrics, earn value metrics, logic, lags, constraints. In fact, I can pick and choose, and I can add these to my analyzer to make my own custom, custom metrics view. I even have some industry standard areas down here, or the Defense Management Contract, uh, Defense Contract Management Agency, Government Accountability Office, some nuclear power metrics. Um, here as well. So I can mix and match to create my own compliance and performance views. And if I still don't find what I'm looking for in those 300 or so metrics, 
we have a full metrics editor. I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of the metrics editor uh, today. That would take about an extra 30 minutes. But what I will say is we have the 300 metrics. All of the metrics that we ourselves have in Fuse were written in the metrics editor. So you as the user have the same flexibility that we had when we developed the software. In fact, one of my most favorite things to do when I'm writing a metric is to take an existing metric and then modify it to suit my needs. For instance, if I want to pinpoint hard constraints that are only being used in a particular location where the project's being executed, I can go to the hard constraints metric. Usually I make a copy first. I didn't hear uh, for the sake of time, but um, let's see, I don't have location in this schedule, but I have level two. And I can look for hard constraints where level two equals a particular value in the, in the WBS. I'm just going to make up a value here. So now this, I've just changed the way this metric works. It's only going to look for hard constraints where the value in level two equals Texas. Again, not to spend too much time there, but I want to make you aware that you've got the flexibility to mod modify these metrics um, any way that you need. I'm going to show you two more tabs in Fuse here, and then we'll move on to, to Risk and, and 360. So we're still in that S2. We're still kind of reviewing um, these schedules here. In fact, I have them listed out here on the left-hand side. Um, on this Logic tab, I get a more in-depth view of the logic that's being used in my schedule. Hey, this is a CPM schedule. Its foundation is Logic. So I have this whole space devoted to just investigating the logic that's been used on the schedule. I have the common relationship types. Let, let me do immediately check for start to finish relationships. Unfortunately, in this schedule, I don't have any. I can look for start to start in my other relationship types. I can immediately look for the lags and leads that are used on my schedule. I can, um, let's see, I can sort and group these as well. Let's group by, um, oh, I don't know, predecessor type. So now I'm looking at my lags. I have 33 of them. 31 are on normal activities, and then two of these lags are on milestones. And any of these fields in here, I can drag to this top area and do a similar type of grouping. I, I could use the WBS. I could look for lags that are pinpointed on a particular predecessor by grouping by predecessor. Anything that I want to do. When I'm done, I just drag it out of the way, and I'm back to my normal uh, sortable list. One of my favorites is this redundancy index. This tells me where I have paths in the schedule that are redundant with other paths in the schedule. Here I have a predecessor and successor relationship, but I have an alternate path that gets me to that predecessor success, successor relationship. They're redundant with one another. Um, I, when I developed schedules, um, I always had too much logic in my schedules. It was kind of the way that I operated. Um, but what I've learned is in the S1 to S5 environment, the redundant relationships um, make it more difficult for me to do a reliable risk and acceleration exercise because uh, they add some air pressure to the equation um, where, the, where there's more than one path uh, through the same activities. If I need to do an acceleration exercise or do a, a real in-depth uh, risk analysis, they kind of get in the way. Um, we have the provision A to show them to you here, but we even have a, a cleanser as well that will remove the redundant relationships and error on the side of including the most detailed logic, but not the redundant um, workaround logic that you see here uh, in the picture. We can look for circular logic. Unfortunately, I don't have any. We can look for open ends. I know I've got some open ends because we saw those 11 items come up on the other screen. Uh, some of the other no-nos, logic on summary tasks, out-of-sequence activities, um, a start, driving, a finish. Um, uh, another, another couple items worthy of mention here are these open starts and open finishes. I remember these by going up here and looking at the picture. Uh, let's look at open finishes. I have a start-to-start -start relationship between these two tasks pictured here. In fact, let me go ahead and click on it too. Um, but the finish date on the first activity actually isn't driving anything. So um, some scheduling tools that have the provision to check for missing logic actually wouldn't detect this as make missing logic because they would see that there's a predecessor and successor relationship between these two tasks. However, the finish isn't driving anything. We don't want that. If, if we're going to finish an activity, 
we want to see where it would be part of you know a critical path of events, um, which um, which we wouldn't have in this case of these activities. So here's a case where I'd want to tighten up the logic a little bit. One of our newer features is the logic sensitivity. Let me do a quick analysis here. We've selected a random activity here. You can pick the individual activity in the schedule. And we've nudged it by 600 days because we wanted to see what would happen if this activity got pushed. We want to see if it would ultimately become part of our critical path. If it wouldn't, it means it's not tied into the logic. It might be an open finish or it might be missing logic entirely. There's 66 days of nudge on this source, first activity, nudge activity, before this target activity is impacted. Now, we've got the freedom here. I use some random activities here, but you've got the freedom to pick a nudge activity and a destination activity. We actually run a CPM simulation here in Fuse, and it's told me that I have 66 days of flex on this activity um, before it would start impacting. I can even create a scenario, a version of my schedule that has the 600 days added um, to, to this task. Now you can change the 600. 100 days. That might seem unreasonable, but if you want to create a scenario where this task may have increased by 50 days, you can do that right here. I'm going to go to one other item here in Fuse, uh, which is the forensics. I used this extensively for scope control, particularly the added and removed activities. If there's activities being added from the point of baseline in the schedule updates, they might, they might be legitimate, but I want to know about it right away. In a regulated environment, that could mean that I have a scope and scope control issue, and I certainly don't want a scope control issue <laughs> uh, when it comes to work uh, working with my customer. I can also look at any relationships that I've modified along the way, resource assignments, calendars that have changed in any field in my schedule, not just these key fields that we have here, but any field in my schedule that's changed along the way, I can track the changes on. When I'm done, as on most screens in Fuse, I can publish to Excel. It creates an Excel document where all these categories are sheet tabs. That's true of the logic as well. It's true of the diagnostic screen um, as well. Um, so all in all, Jay, your schedule did pretty well. I think it scored at, at uh, 53%. Let's go ahead and let's do a risk analysis. I'll use this. Um, I'll use this initial plan schedule since I have it open here. Let's let's go over here to Acumen Risk. And in fact, let me select initial plan over here. Okay. Now we're not going to do a full risk, full up risk exercise in the next 15 minutes. I'm going to show some easy ways that I can get started with Acumen Risk, um, even if I have a team that's not entirely experienced with risk management. Uh, here I've got the schedule. I'm going to expand out a couple of the items here. Uh, we support probabilistic risk, as I mentioned earlier, and then also deterministic risk, risk register type risk. I'm going to create some three-point estimates, some minimum, most likely, and maximum durations for a series of activities. Now, the way that I used to do this was I would do 10 key on my keyboard. I was using Microsoft Project, and uh, by the end of the day, my fingers were pretty tired, and we weren't entirely sure what we ended up with in terms of a risk exercise. Here, I can rate the risk quality of my tasks using these sliders. You could see at first, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do that again. At first, I did it at the top level for commissioning. And I told the system that all the commissioning tasks have been planned very aggressively. But what I'm able to do also is dial that back a little bit for any individual tasks. In fact, I can calibrate the whole program at once from an uncertainty perspective and then start tweaking individual items. So I can go top down or I can go bottom up, if you will. As I'm moving those sliders, it's populating minimum, most likely, and maximum durations for my activities. No more 10 keying. I can simply move the sliders. And the one thing that I've found is it's very easy to explain the sliders to someone who's not particularly familiar or comfortable even with risk management. I have another option, and this is one of the most exciting things that I've found with Acumen Risk. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to recalibrate back to off. For, all, for most or all of these items. I have what's called the risk advisor. Earlier on, I had, uh, I think for this schedule, it's about a 26% quality score. 
there's a lot of fixes to be made in the schedule, there's a lot of uncertainty. What I'm able to do is use that score down to the individual activity level for the system to give me a recommendation on the uncertainty for the tasks. Let's have it do that. I've used the quality of the schedule itself to evaluate the uncertainty of the various activities. You can see some of them, it's rated as green. Some of the lower quality activities that have missing logic, maybe some negative float, maybe they're a merge or diverge hotspot with lots of logic on them, it's rated those items as red. And it's given them higher uncertainty durations, higher maximum durations than some of the items that are in green. At this point, I can run a Monte Carlo simulation, and I can tell you, based on the quality of this schedule alone, it has a 0% chance of being executed on time. The deterministic date is February 1st. The best case date is February 27th, and more likely is an April or May completion time frame. That's not going to work very well for my project team. On top of that, I have a risk register. I'm going to import one for the sake of time. On top of the uncertainty from the low quality in my schedule, I have risks that I can map over to activities and summaries as well. This is going to create a big problem for me. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to run another risk analysis now that I've mapped some risks, and things are going to go from bad to worse, because not only am I taking these uncertainties into account, I'm also now taking these tangible risks that could affect my, my program. In fact, my, uh, my April, uh, April and May finish time frame, adding my risks into the equation, has now gone, now gone out to a July and August time frame. My team's not going to be very comfortable with that. Our first action is to improve the quality of our schedule. That's going to bring more certainty around these items. I also need to sit down and interview each of my engineers because it's entirely possible after speaking with them and improving the quality of their schedule, we can move some of these sliders from red to green. Every slider that I move, every risk that I can mitigate, is going to get me closer to my deterministic finish date. It might not get me all the way. All projects have risk. All projects have things that can go wrong. We want to have the best plan from the outset to give us the highest probability of success. I don't want to see zero because I know what that means. It means I'm not going to get there. I'm going to build a scenario based on this simulation that I've run, and we're going to use our optimizer to see if we can actually get, do some other things besides risk to get the schedule back to the original finish date of February 1st. February 1st. So I'm going to create a scenario that's going to have a July 15th P50 completion date. And if I go back to my S1 project screen, it's just created this scenario. That it's in contrast to my initial plan that has a February 1st completion date. So I'm going to go to Acumen 360 now, which is my schedule accelerator and optimizer, and I'm going to try some things to see what it would take to get this schedule back in line with the original goal dates. I'm going to click Accelerate Schedule. It was, I got a little scared the first time I ever clicked that. You, you hear schedule acceleration, and of course you need to make a plan that the people executing the plan can stand up to. It's one thing to accelerate it here in a scenario. It's another thing for them to commit to the plan. But let's try and give ourselves the best chance possible. Let's put our best foot forward. Our current finish date is June 24th, 2013. The finish date that we need is February 1st. I have, another, I have a number of acceleration scenarios. Let's use this one called normal acceleration. It's going to try to reduce some durations in our activities and maybe some lags as well. It's trying. It's trying. You can see it visually even trying through different scenarios. It's given us a report. It targeted February 1st. It actually got us a day earlier. It got us to a January 31st, 2013 completion date. I can go ahead and I can add this as a scenario as well. You can see now it's called Initial Plan Scenario 1. Um, if you remember the forensics tool that I had earlier, let, in fact, let me remove some of these other some of these other scenarios so we can look one for one.
on our original plan, our risk-adjusted scenario, and then our accelerated scenario. Let me pull those into forensics. And let me look specifically at remaining duration. From initial plan to a risk-adjusted scenario, these are the cuts that I would need to make in these durations in order to, to take risk into account on my schedule while still delivering on time. Let's, let's look at a couple of these in particular. This task called phase four. It had an original duration of 15 days. The risk adjusted scenario brought it to 22 days. I'll need to sit down with the owner of that task and see if there's any way possible to perform that work in 11 days. Whether that means more resources, work being performed um, in parallel, in other words, their predecessor that they're waiting for, provide them work sooner so that they could begin work and hopefully finish within 11 days. All of these aren't going to be possible, but this is one scenario that would get me to my February 1st completion date after taking risk into account on the project. The good news is, is even if they can't stand up to these, I can go back, I can rerun my risk exercise with a different set of assumptions and, and mitigations, and I can accelerate my schedule in different ways too. In fact, one thing I didn't do is I can remove some of those gotchas in the schedule, like hard constraints, before I start my acceleration exercise. If some of those hard constraints have just been put in as placeholders, and they're really compensating for missing logic or other relationships that should take place, if I remove those, I might have a better chance of meeting my finish date. On the other hand, I need to make sure that my schedule is reasonable and makes sense um, without my hard constraints. So that was a quick overview. I tried to get, <laughs> I tried to go through all three of, of our uh, Acumen products, starting with Phoenix, and then onto our Acumen products of Fuse, Risk, um, and 360. If you'll notice too, one thing I didn't mention is our S1 through S5 indicators are here throughout the menu of the application. So I said we had this overarching theme as Jay and I were going through. He went through the S1 piece, and then as I went through these different screens, you may have noticed my diagnostics were S2, S3 was risk, and then onto uh, reporting and dashboards, which is S5. Jen, have we received any questions during the, uh, during the webinar? Yeah, the, um, the first one here I can go ahead and answer um, is ask if we're going to be sending out the slides from today's presentation. And yes, we'll be sending out the slides as well as a recording of the webinar to everyone um, probably this afternoon. So. The next one is for Jay. Um, it asks, what is Phoenix's compatibility to Primavera and Microsoft Project as far as importing and exporting go? Um, for Primavera XDR, we can go back and forth with. Um, and then for uh, Project, uh, Microsoft Project, we can import uh, Project XML and export Project XML. Um, it's not the uh, the MPP file, but it's uh, if you go in project and save it as XML, you can get it in and out that way. <clears throat> and right now we're doing a lot of work on our import and export to get everything really coming in and out of Phoenix and uh, make it as solid as possible so that you're able to um, actually generate an XCR that's going to work going back and forth with uh, owners in that. Okay, and then the next one for you, Jay, is um, is the network view driven by the activity ID relationships and just rearranged by the user for visual presentation, or is the network actually built that then provides the info to the activity IDs for relationships? Um, it's it's based off of it, it and the bar chart are the same thing. Um, you move it around a network diagram and it won't change your bar chart. Um, you can increase durations and make ties in the network diagram that will uh, be um, represented also in the bar chart. But um, really, the network diagram is just a way to move your activities around in a, in a better looking view. It's, it's the way to paint the pretty picture of your schedule. OK. Um, the next one's for you, Tom. It asks, what is the metrics basis for scoring? What is the metrics basis for scoring? OK. Mm -hmm. the, um, let me go ahead over to Fuse and demonstrate that. The score is actually developed on the fly based on the metrics that I've selected here. Um, so our, our schedule quality tab is our official index score, but you can actually uh, generate your own score 
based on any metrics that you select and it will score you based on those specific metrics that you've uh, customized the screen with. Okay, and then um, we'll just do one more because I know we're running out of time, but it asks, is there a metric to display activities that have a percent complete value greater than zero, but no actual start has been assigned? Um, yeah, let's see. If I don't have that out of the box, that's a very easy one to design. I think I've got one called wrong status, and oh look, I passed that one uh, pretty well. Uh, this is activities that have been statused in the future. Um, we also have uh, we also have metrics that have been uh, left in the past unstatused as well. Now some scheduling tools won't let you do that, but some will. So we're able to check for that as well. Okay. Well, I think we will um, have to answer the rest of the questions after the webinar. Tom, can you put up our contact information that last slide? Oh yes, yes. Uh, Go back over to PowerPoint here. And I'll put that up full screen. So here's where you can access some resources on our website, including our white papers. You can get a free trial of the Acumen software suite if you would like to try out some of these metrics and checks. And we can also help you get in touch with Phoenix for more information on their scheduling tools. So thanks, Tom and Jay, both for your presentation today. It was a good one. And we will look forward to having you speak again. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Jen.